Good evening and welcome to Distinctive Voices. I'm Susan Marty. Please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. Fred Gage. Thank you very much for that kind invitation or uh, introduction and for this invitation to speak to you all. Thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, I know it's a, an effort on your parts to take part of your evening and come to an auditorium and listen to, about, listen to science. Um, but I, I take this as, a, as an opportunity and a responsibility as a scientist in this community to uh, give back a bit to the community and try to give them some insights into what we do and why we do what we do and try to make it interesting and fun as we go along. So the title of uh, the lecture yeah, it has to do with stem cell biology and its potential applications. I'm going to focus primarily on the uh, nervous system, the application of stem cells to nervous system. And a, a few caveats to begin with. Um, I'm going to narrow in on uh, some of the applications of this uh, technology uh, that I believe are the most promising. Uh, and at the end, I'm going to talk about not just the controversial type of stem cells that I'll teach you about, but also about some of the residual stem cells that exist in the body in different organs and how we might tap into those as well. Um, but first, I have to tell you about cells, because that's the key to uh, the lecture. And uh, understanding what cells are and where they come from, how they're made, uh, is crucial to what's going on. So stem cells and their applications uh, first need to be understood in the concept of, of what a cell is. And interestingly, the term cell uh, was coined in 1656 by Robert Hooke when he looked in the first compound microscope at a section of cork. <clears throat> and this is what he saw. This is sort of magnification of a slice through a very thin layer of cork. And what he saw were these little chambers. And they looked like cells to him. And when he was thinking about cells, it's not how we think about cells now, but he was thinking about them as prison cells. And so each one of these was termed a prison cell. And that's where the term cell actually emerged. Of course, later on it became uh, a more of a functional term, but this is true with much descriptive science as we see it and we call it as we see it. The basic cell theory is a, a doctrine that states that all organisms are composed of similar units of organization, and these are called cells. The concept was formally articulated as early as 1839. And this predates uh, some of the great theories of biology, paradigm-shifting theories like Darwin's theory, which was 1859, inheritance, and biochemistry in 1940. To us as, as biologists, it's clear that ultrastructural, subatomic level uh, analysis has revealed much more about the inner workings of cells, but the unit of the cell uh, in biology is, uh, for us, equivalent to the atomic theory in physics. So what is a cell, and how big is it, and how can you actually think about it? And I, I, I feel I need to take you through this in order for you to understand what a stem cell is and how this can relate to the rest of our body. So the cells, individual cells themselves, can range in size from one micron to 50,000 microns. Because you don't have to know what a micron is yet, but because I'm going I'm to let you know that. But just to give you an idea of the range of sizes that a cell can, can be. So here's my uh, demonstration to try to get a concept of, to try to get the concept of scale in mind. So this is someone's finger. And they have a pen here. And I don't know if you can see it very well, but there's a hair. And this is a normal magnification. So we're going to magnify as we go up. And we're going to see this. And uh, let's take it up to a magnification of 10. Well, now you can see the head of the pen. It looks like there's something on that head of the pen. We'll take that up to 100. And now we're seeing. Uh, a dust mite, and something else here we can't really see. So we'll need to take that up magnified uh, a thousandfold. And now we can see uh, a lymphocyte. Here's the a white blood cell and some ragweed. But there are 
There might be something in here as well, so we'll take that up another 10,000. And now we're looking at viruses, and we're looking at E. coli. And we take that even further up the chain to 100,000 magnification, and we can see Ebola virus and rhinoviruses, which are small. And I'm going to just take you back to see where we are right now at something on the order of 400,000 magnification. And those are, and we'll take this back to what we call a cell. So here's a cell. Boy, they look gigantic compared to viruses. But then as we go back out into the world, we see the head of the pen. So cells are small. They can be quite small. All right, so that's a cell and the range of cells that we have. Now, how does that relate to our bodies? So an organism, as I said, is made up of all these individual cells, literally trillions of cells. And each one of these cells is by itself a factory. It has within it organelles which maintain its survival and continually produce the proteins that are necessary to maintain that cell and certainly are important when the cell undergoes cell division and divides. Inside the cell is an important feature called a nucleus. And in the nucleus contains elements that are the building blocks on which the proteins that make up the cell are made. And those are terms we use like chromosomes. We have 23 pairs of chromosomes. And along these chromosomes are DNA molecules that together form genetic material or DNA. And the DNA forms the template for making RNA, which then can take amino acids, pull them together, and make the proteins that make up the cell. So we take a surface, a membrane of a cell like this, all these membrane proteins that are involved in transporting proteins in and out of the cell or skeletal proteins which hold the shape of the cell are all made from that cell inside its own nucleus. So it's a factory in and of itself. And every cell has this capacity to make itself. So the basic principles are that cells are functional units of the human body, small businesses, you can think of them. And each one has this, and they have different functions in different parts of the body. So there are cells that make insulin in the pancreas, many different types of neurons that make different types of cells, heart cells, all of them, though, with a basic setup. And as I'll talk about a little bit later, most diseases are, in fact, diseases of cells, as we see them. So what are stem cells? These are the most diverse and primitive cells, and they're stem cells. We'll talk what they are, where they come from, what we can do with them, and some new exciting findings that have sort of turned a lot of our thoughts around with regard to what is a stem cell. So some basic fundamental principles are that a stem cell really has two definitions. It can self-renew. That means it can divide and give rise to a copy of itself. And it can do that, what we call symmetrically, when it makes two copies of itself. Or it can retain itself as a single copy in an asymmetric cell division, and then its other daughter cell can give rise to a differentiated cell. And its ability to give rise to a differentiated cell is, in fact, the second major feature of a stem cell, not just that it can continue to differentiate, but that it can also differentiate or continue to divide, but can differentiate into other cells. Well, there's more. In addition to these general definitions of a stem cell, the complexity of stem cells comes from the word that comes before it. We talk about pluripotent stem cells and multipotent stem cells as two major categories that we talk about. A pluripotent stem cell is a cell that can give rise to essentially every cell of the body. So it's so primitive that it can give rise to hair and skin and brain cells. Whereas a multilineage, multipotent stem cell is generally cells that are born, that are retained postnatally in organs, in every organ, and can give rise only to cells of that organ. So, for example, there are blood cells that are stem cells, but they're restricted to that blood lineage. And there are brain stem cells, but they're restricted to becoming brain cells. So there are, however, stem cells in all organs, or most organs. And 
Those for which we haven't found stem cells yet, it's likely that we will, is my wild prediction. So in the hair and in gut you have, in blood, you have cells that are turning over all the time. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. There are other organs where there are limited number of stem cells or liver regions, and I'll tell you more about this too, like liver and the brain, but they're persistent and they contribute to the function of the organ. And then there are areas that are still debated, like heart and fat, but even in those areas we're finding that there are cells that have properties of stem cells. That means that they can either self-propagate themselves and give rise to more cells of that lineage endogenously. So one of the ones we know most about, because it was one of the earliest ones defined, is the hemopoietic or blood stem cells, and they were first defined in 1963. They can populate all cells of the blood system, both red and white blood cells, and they're important for many blood-related diseases. They're found in the bone marrow, and this is this term that we use in stem cell biology called a niche, is a structure within which the stem cell retains its ability to survive and propagate all the other cells of its lineage. So the niche is a loosely defined region, and it's an area of great study right now and trying to understand more about the niche, but it's a term we use for all the different stem cell areas. Skin stem cells have been investigated, and they are involved in wound healing and hair growth. They have very specific characteristics. Their niche is called a bulge, and they sit in an inactive state often, but can be activated in a variety of circumstances, and then the cells will start migrating up the shaft. And there's obviously hope or predictions that this may have some effect in balding, but already the effects in burn victims has been seen, and there's great promise in that area. Intestines, amazingly, the intestine lining is replaced every five days. Your intestine lining is replaced, and it's replaced because of this crypt where the stem cells for the gut reside, and they have an amazing path where they continually migrate up and fill in the villi to make the villi of the gut every day, every five days. It's a constant, ongoing process, a terrific area of investigation right now. We're learning lots about basic stem cell biology by virtue of the dynamic feature of this. Neural stem cells, an area that I work in, and talk to you a little bit more about it later, we believe now these stem cells that we found in the hippocampus, the structure involved in learning and memory, are involved intimately in that learning and memory, and we know that experience and interactions with our environment can have an impact on the survival and integration of these cells, and subsequently that can have an impact on your behavior. There's a concept that we're challenged with right now and are coming to grips with, and I'm going to challenge you all with this a little bit later, not in a test, but just as I tell you about things. Don't worry, don't worry. It's this concept of transdifferentiation, something we feel has had an up and down reputation in the field of stem cell biology, and this would be the idea that a cell of one fate, say a blood cell, could convert itself over into a brain cell. This is a slide that says this, and I have to give it a qualifying. We believe that this is not a standard feature, and it was promised for a long time that this was possible, that you could take blood cells and turn them into brain cells or make them into any other kind of cell, or that they would naturally do that, and we don't believe that is true anymore. We believe that, based on a lot of good experimental evidence, that these cells are, under normal circumstances, restricted to the lineages that they have. However, more recent experiments, and I'll tell you about them, show us that under certain circumstances you can force the cell of a committed lineage, you can force it by genetic methods to become a completely different cell, and this is a very exciting area. So transdifferentiation 
is making its uh, way back into our work, although we're not really calling it that anymore. So pluripotent embryonic stem cells differentiate, as I said, into many different cells. Once we get them into that pluripotent state, but how do, how do we do that? Well, one of the ways in which this is done is in uh, in vitro fertilization clinics where egg and sperm are put together and fertilized for a period of time, and then they uh, grow and expand into a blastocyst, which is then transferred uh, enzymatically. The inner cell mass is transferred into a, a dish where it's used for experiments. In the in vitro fertilization clinic, it's taken this uh, Blastocyst is then frozen down or implanted for pregnancy. So that's what happens in the in vitro fertilization clinic. And this is sort of what it looks like. This is one day after fertilization. This is a two days. We've got two cells there. Four days. Cells are dividing. We're doing, undergoing symmetric cell division. So you've got the terminology down. Now we're getting into a good quality eight, L, uh, eight stage. We call that a a morula. This is a multi uh, morula stage here. And then it makes a big transition about uh, day five where it becomes the early uh, blastocyst. And this is the, the major <coughs> first biological differentiation state where these, all these cells at this point of the morula are, are, are pluripotent. They can become any cell of the body. <coughs> but once they transition in just one day to a blastocyst, there's a differentiation between this outer cell layer, which becomes the placenta, and the inner cell mass, which then becomes all the other cells of the body. <clears throat> and it's at this stage that, um, at the blastocyst stage, the cultured blastocyst stage, where you would either go into it, uh, froze it down or implant, or you'd isolate this inner cell mass into a culture dish. And under certain conditions, those cells can then uh, maintain their proliferation indefinitely as a embryonic stem cell, as a, mo as a pluripotent stem cell. <clears throat> now, embryonic stem cells are derived from these pre-implantation embryos. And by virtue of that, uh, some people are opposed to this research uh, at all because one fertilized egg is destroyed for each uh, line generated. There are, in fact, hundreds of thousands of frozen embryos from uh, IVF, IVF clinics that are overproduced, uh, from which uh, some of the cells, th that's the pool of cells from which uh, embryonic stem cells are derived, <coughs> is the overage. So with, with the controversy, there's the reality, and that is that Many diseases are associated with cell damage and cell loss. Uh, diabetes is, is um, a, a disease of, of pancreatic cells, of violet cells in the pancreas. Certainly spinal cord injury is in part due to local damage of cells in the spinal cord, but disconnecting cells from one another, heart failure, of course. Uh, Alzheimer's disease is a, a disease of certain subpopulations of neurons, just as is Parkinson's disease, where there are subpopulations of, disease, of cells that, that die. And this sort of highlights the fact that uh, where our, our lack of, of knowledge in this is, is that this is a brain cell disease, but in one case, the disease targets one population of cells, whereas in other diseases, uh, other cells are targeted. Retinitis pigmentosa is a disease of, the, of retinal cells and muscular dystrophy is a disease of muscles. <clears throat> so I believe that the advantage of using human cells and, and the promise of this going forward uh, is that these are human cells and we can study these human cells. They're self-renewing and they're pluripotent so they can give rise to all, all cells, all the body. Now how would we use them? How do we, how do we as scientists use these uh, embryonic stem cells that we can uh, generate well, we can use them to understand for the first time some of the basic uh, mechanisms that are involved in early cell development. Where we, by using those cells, knowledge of the very earliest stages of development are being uh, 
taken on and understood in ways that we hadn't been able to think of them before. You've heard of, in the press, the promise for transplantation, that the cells will be used to replace missing cells. I believe this is going to be a hard one. It's certainly one of the promises, but there are a lot of leaps and hurdles, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But they can also be used, these human cells can be used to, to model uh, human disease, and I'm going to give you a few examples of that. I think that this approach can help to develop uh, new strategies for drug development. And then, in addition, um, there's the hope and the plan and evidence now that taking single uh, embryonic stem cells, expanding the cells and treating them can begin to generate organs, complex organs within a dish that then can be used for organ transplants at later time, and also to understand the basic mechanisms of how organs are formed in this way. So the stem ther stem cell therapy part of it <clears throat> is with an egg and a sperm. We have to see this slide a couple times. We get a fertilized egg. Now we have the morula, where all these cells are equipotent. They're all pluripotent cells. Then the first differentiation occurs, where we have the inner cell mass. The inner cell mass is digested and put into a, a, a plate of cells that can be propagated. And these are the notorious pluripotent embryonic stem cells. These are the um, cells that we talk about and that are, are of controversy. But so far, these cells have been evidenced that they can differentiate into essentially from a dish, from a single dish of these tiny cells that we were talking about, can give rise to uh, basically every cell of the body. And then, of course, and here's a, you know, this, the standard thing. We, we, we show this, this picture of a, um, of a beating heart as if it's a, and this was derived from these cells, but this is almost a spontaneous feature. You can give the cells, these cells in the dish a couple chemicals, and they spontaneously form beating muscle uh, in the tissue. So it's not a, a great feat, but it's a, it's a good demonstration. So the idea then, of course, is to generate specific lineages so that those cells that are missing in the patient with diabetes can have a, a pancreatic transplant or, <clears throat> in the case of liver diseases. But there are real challenges in this area of human transplantation of cells. And here, here are the ones that the community is, <clears throat> is clearly dealing with. And one is being able to satisfactorily drive all these cells in the dish to one lineage. So if you're going to transplant in, say, diabetes, where you want islet cells, you want to transplant really islet cells and not some brain cells and muscle cells and heart cells into the pancreas at that time. And you want them to be um, differentiated uh, at the right stage so that they'll, be, uh, they'll survive and integrate uh, appropriately. Another major, and, that, and, and we're not there yet. This is, a, this is ongoing, but not there. There's immunity, and there's immunological differences between all of us, but the number of embryonic stem cells, <clears throat> they retain uh, their immunological identity. So if you're transplanting from a source of cells and a limited number of cells that exist currently, the number of individuals uh, that would be able to receive uh, cells without immunosuppression is really quite limited. So Im Im immunity is a big problem. Tumors is an issue because how can we be absolutely certain that all the cells, all the millions of cells that we have in the dish actually differentiate into uh, mature cells and that none of the remaining cells retain that pluripotent status so that they might, uh, upon transplantation, proliferate and cause a tumor. And the other <clears throat> final issue that I, I struggle with a lot is this idea of uh, site-specific integration. And it turns out that many cells uh, start in one location when they're born, but then they need to migrate to another location in order to differentiate. <clears throat> and we don't really understand all those principles well right now. So on the one hand, you could say that this uh, looks overwhelming in terms of the challenges for transplantation. On the other hand, from an experimental point of view, it's, it, all of these are challenges that when met and even addressed will open up new and important areas that are of basic science but also leading towards that application. The other way to think about this, these cells more immediately <clears throat> for immediate outcome 
is using the cells as cell-based models for human disease to investigate mechanisms of disease and to screen for potential drugs. So how would that be, how would that be done? So I'll give you a couple examples. This is, this is one example of an approach towards this aim in a disease called ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease. It's a late onset disease. People don't have it, don't start showing signs until their late 30s. But it, it's a very rapid declining disease. And truthfully, we don't understand the mechanism of the disease. But what happens empirically is that the cells of the spinal cord, the neurons of the spinal cord that send their processes out to the legs and the arms degenerate and these cells die. So a single motor neuron in the spinal cord of Pele here has an axon that goes all the way down to the toe. And through a variety of disease processes, in ALS, slowly this nerve begins to degenerate until the cells die. And we were trying to figure out a way to understand how this process occurs. So here's a strategy using humanionic stem cells that some find promising. So now we've got here, we have our human embryonic stem cells. But it turns out that we know a small fraction of the cells, a small fraction of individuals that have this disease have a very specific mutation in a gene called SOD1. Where they have mutations or disruptions within the gene, so it doesn't perform well. It's an aberrant gene. It's not working well. And it's making bad protein. So one strategy to model this is to take normal, healthy embryonic stem cells that we have in a dish and then overexpress within those cells the gene. And then develop protocols where we can induce those stem cells to differentiate into those motor neurons of the spinal cord and see what the impact is of making this mutant gene in there. Now, if we can model this in some way, then we can begin to understand mechanistically why this gene is causing the damage in those cells. Because uniquely, we can differentiate these cells into motor cells. And once we begin to understand the molecular mechanisms, we can use this same dish of motor neurons that are affected as tools to screen for small compounds that might be able to protect against the devastating effects of this mutant protein. So here's what these, here's the progress or idea of how this would be done, is starting with these human embryonic stem cells and then through a series of complicated steps that actually recapitulate the biology of how normal motor neurons are made in the spinal cord. And this knowledge that's now being applied to human embryonic stem cells has been generated by developmental biologists working in mice and other species that discovered the molecules and the signaling pathways that were necessary to take the cell from these early stages. And most of this was done in mice, but it's now being translated into human cells. And we're finding out the similarities and differences. But the fact is that this process of being able to make motor neurons, human motor neurons in a dish, is now a reliable phenomenon. And you can start with the simple cells, turn them into an embryoid body, we call it. Then they form these early neural progenitor cells that we isolate in smaller groups. And then with another set of molecules that are important for developmental differentiation down motor neurons, we can get the cells to differentiate down these lineages. And now, within a period of six weeks to two months, we have cholinergic, these neurons that express all the genes and proteins that are required to call these cells motor neurons. And it's not just those. We can measure the cells. We can make sure that they're expressing. Long processes, and we can co-culture them with muscle. And normally, they make connections with muscle. And we can demonstrate in culture that these human cells will innervate muscle. And we can record from them electrically and demonstrate that they have the signature of a real live motor neuron. But now we've captured it in a dish. 
Now, one of the – one of the more compelling models and ideas about this particular disease is that it's not just a disease of the motor neuron, but it's a disease of the environment, that the cells surrounding this motor neuron are contributing to the disease. They're acting in an inflammatory way, and they are really the progressors of the disease. And there's accumulating evidence from a variety of sources that the astrocyte surrounding the motor neuron is responsible for this. So one way – now we can begin to test this in human cells to see if this is true. Human ES cells can be induced to make these astrocytes in culture, and they can be induced to make neurons. So what we can do now is make human astrocytes and then put the mutant gene into the human astrocytes, and then take wild-type or normal, healthy motor neurons and put them together with those sick astrocytes and determine whether or not the death of the motor neurons can be attributable to the astrocytes alone. And this has been done now by a variety of experimenters showing that not only contact with the cell can kill a healthy motor neuron, but even secreted proteins. You don't even have to transfer the astrocytes into the dish. You can just take the conditioned media, the media that's made from these cells, and pour it onto the motor neurons, and they will undergo cell division or cell death. Well, now this affords the opportunity to begin to look for small molecules that might, in fact, be helpful. So here's the strategy, is taking human astrocytes that are overexpressing the gene and screen these astrocytes to reduce their inflammatory responses, looking for compounds that might be effective. And then once you identify these small molecules, then you can co-culture and treat the motor neurons that have been exposed to the conditioned media or to the astrocytes and measure outcome measures. Well, this is possible. And now there are, in fact, companies that are taking this up and using the fact that there is an exaggerated response in astrocytes to the overexpression of this mutation and beginning to identify compounds that are moving toward clinical trials in ALS, in part because of the work that's been done by a variety of recent investigators in this field. So one of the things that you might have thought about in this while I was telling you the story is that I think it's a very exciting opportunity, but we're having to put the mutant gene inside the cell. And it requires that we know which gene is mutated and what the mutation looks like in order to do these kinds of experiments. The ideal situation is if we could actually have cells from the patient themselves that had the disease. That way we could even go to diseases that we don't even know what the genetic basis is, but rather use these cells to do that. How are we going to do that? And I won't go into the number of ways that many of us were thinking about doing this, but an amazing finding, discovery was made about three years ago by Shinichi Yamanaka, who did an experiment. Actually, it was his technician in his lab, as it always is. It's some very smart technician in the lab, very persistent guy. And Shinichi tells the story about how he kept telling the guy, stop doing that, stop doing that, get to work on the problem you have to get. What he did was he took ordinary skin biopsies, grew the cells in a dish, they grow really well. Remember, I told you about skin stem cells, and skin cells can be grown in a dish, but they're lineage restricted. They can only become skin cells. Well, a growing work of stem cell biology realized that there was a certain class of genes, a certain cluster of genes, that were the signature of the cell when it was a stem cell, when it was an authentic pluripotent stem cell. But we didn't know all the genes. There could be thousands of genes that would define the cells in the cell. But what Shinichi did was to go through them systematically and put these embryonic stem cell genes back into the skin fibroblast. The simple idea is if I put the genes in the cell that are in an ES cell, in a mature cell, can I induce it to differentiate backwards into an embryonic stem cell? Pathetically idea, you know, that's crazy. Of course, a lot of us were trying this at the time, but he did it. 
He actually showed that you could take these four genes first in a, in a mouse fibroblast skin line, turned them back into embryonic stem cells, and implanted those cells into uh, a pregnant female, and it gave rise to pups. So a skin cell could give rise to an entire uh, organism. And he proved it by making one of the genes green, so the mouse that came out was all green. <laughs> so this is really remarkable. Then a, a flurry. You know, in science, you know, there are these discoveries like this, and they, it's cold fusion. It's you know, not really sure. But very quickly, hundreds of labs re re replicated this. This is a, there were slight variations, but this is actually quite a reliable technique now. And I'm going to tell you about one set of experiments. So you can, you can imagine the first thing that uh, people did to say if this is unique to mouse or human was just to, let's just take a mouse, a skin cell from humans and see if it works for humans. And sure enough, you could use these four genes, maybe another one, overexpress them, put them inside skin fibroblasts in a dish, and they would, with time, convert back into embryonic stem cells that you could then transfer and propagate as embryonic stem cells independently. Then those embryonic stem cells derived from that person's skin could be induced into neurons or heart cells or brain cells or any cell of that person. And they're still alive, and you can look at their brain cells in a dish. Well, we said, this is pretty good. This is pretty good. Because now we can start looking at cells, uh, brain cells, and looking at diseases where we don't really understand the biology. And we might be able to use this model system to, to tap into this and understand uh, and look at the cells in some ways. We, as cell biologists, we like the idea of being able to look inside uh, human cells when they have the disease. So here's a an example uh, in autism. So we know very little bit about autism. We know that there's a lot of genes associated and we have lots of theories about it, but we really don't understand it because we can't watch the cells, uh, brain cells, where th which is, uh, this is a brain disorder. We can't really watch these cells as they uh, differentiate to see if we can monitor what might have gone on during those early stages and see inside the brain if we can see what the changes are or differences that might be there. So we and others have initiated uh, a series of experiments take, taking biopsies from uh, autistic patients and growing their cells in culture, their fibroblast cells, inducing the genes into them and reverting them back into embryonic stem cells and then driving them back into neurons and comparing them to age match controls to see if we can figure out if, what the differences and what the differences might be uh, in these patients. And quite remarkably, um, <clears throat> the, the, it looks normal fibroblast uh, culture. After the four genes are inserted, you get these little clusters of cells. And by now, after a while, you can, you can pick up this cluster. When you look in the dish, and you can tell automatically whether or not you have a good cluster or a bad cluster. But with time, they form uh, characteristics of cells, these rosettes that we know are the neural type that we are, we're interested in, in forming. And they begin to grow out their processes. And within time, these human embryonic stem cells, and, and, and they're called, uh, in the terminology that we're, we're using now, it's called IPS, or induced pluripotent cell, because we're inducing them to become pluripotent cells. And these IPS can be induced to give rise to neurons in, in the same way that we could do it previously with embryonic stem cells uh, alone. And now we can take uh, cells, induce them into neurons, and make uh, and determine, see if we can find out if there are any properties that are different. It's quite remarkable. It takes about two months for an embryonic stem cell to differentiate into a neuron, but it carries many of the properties. We can stick electrodes in them and record from them and determine their, their properties. This is one of the methods that we use. It's called calcium imaging. We put a caged calcium dye into the, into the cells, and all these are individual cells. And as the cells start communicating with them, the calcium is released and has a fluorescent uh, attachment to it, so it, it, sp it sparks, and that gives you an idea of the amount of activity that's going on in the culture. And what, what's, what was remarkable to all of us when we started this was that these cells in a dish spontaneously make connections with each other. So these are induced neurons, and all these little blinkings that are going on in here 
correspond to when one neuron is talking to another. And this is a normal wild-type control. You have to do these experiments a lot. And here is matched cells from an autistic patient. And one of the things that we characteristically see is they don't speak to each other quite as much as we saw from others. That gave us a hint that we and others need to look at this more systematically and more quantitatively. So now you can, each one of those little calcium blips can be monitored computationally for each one of the cells, and you can get a real indication that there is less communication going on in these cells. So that brought us forward to say, okay, if that's the case, maybe they have fewer connections. So we can take individual processes between the wild-type and the autistic neurons, stain for part of the neuron, and then each one of these little puncta correspond to where cells actually make contact with each other. And it's quite striking that the, in this case, in these sets of experiments, the autistic ones have fewer cells, have fewer connecting points. So our view, and these are very early days, I grant you, are that this cell biological approach to understanding disease will be a way for us to understand basic processes of development in the nervous system and in other tissues, but also to get insights into diseases that we wouldn't have had an opportunity to get insights into before. And we think that these cells may have the opportunity to be used for screens, to look for ways in which we could rescue that effect in a dish. So the promise for human embryonic stem cells is large, and transplantation, as well as testing and diagnostics, there's more promise than has been achieved, but the excitement is real, and many young scientists are joining this effort, and I'm glad that I'm still around to be part of this new effort in stem cell biology. So the last part, I'm going to say, what about the adult brain? Are there any, what can we do with this stem cells? And all this discussion about embryonic stem cells, what does this mean with regard to the adult brain? Because I think many of you learned that once the adult brain has formed, there's really no room for continual growth of new cells. But it turns out that concept emerged from the idea that we have 100 billion neurons in our brain. We all do, well, on average. And 100 trillion connections. And these cells are, with 100 trillion connections, 100 times more connectivity, how could a cell, a neuron, a complex neuron, that looks something like this, a cell body with its processes, its connecting points, and its axons that make connections with other cells, how could this cell possibly divide in the adult brain? And that was a conundrum for a long time. It turns out that's not what happens, but rather in certain restricted areas of the brain, there are stem cells. And now you all are stem cell experts, and you know that what that means is that there are primitive cells that have the capacity to self-renew, to give rise to themselves, and to differentiate into a specific cell type. And these cells exist specifically in the structure of the brain called the hippocampus. And this area is involved in learning and memory. It's involved in particularly the acquisition of new memories and the discrimination between events and space and context. These cells help us to guide our way through the more subtle distinctions that we're met with through life. And the way we look at this is we can, in experimental animals, we can pulse them with small molecules that integrate into cells that are undergoing cell division, in this case a nucleotide, an artificial nucleotide that has a location that you can attach an antibody and visualize. So here in the adult rodent brain, all of these black dots are new cells that have been born in the adult. We have other methods where we've used, taken advantage of some of the opportunities that viruses hold for us. We neutralize the virus, but retain its ability to infect a dividing cell. 
and then we can label cells and we can see them quite dramatically. So here are, each one of these green cells is a new cell that was born in the adult brain over a period of about two and a half hours. So the half-life of these viruses is quite short. And now this is eight months, sorry, eight weeks after the injection, and you can see they've matured now, and these primitive dividing stem cells now have long processes, and all this corresponds to the axons that go out and make contact. It's sort of the time course. It doesn't happen immediately. It takes a while, and that time of its integration, we believe, is an important feature. We now know that in this area of the hippocampus, in all mammalian, all species, the mammalian species that we looked at have this process. This is in humans. That some years ago we found that even in humans as late as in their 50s and 60s have continual neurogenesis by using this bromodeoxyuridine methodology. So we can quite remarkably take from the brain these cells in autopsy and grow the cells in tissue. Because they're primitive, they have certain features that they survive death for a short period of time. We can isolate them in culture and expand them. So here are stem cells, a single stem cell from the adult brain that's dividing, or sorry, it's just moving around actually. But if you watch carefully, you'll see it undergo cell division. Go ahead. I've seen this movie, so I know that they do divide. So now we have two cells, and they're going to symmetrically divide and give us four cells. Pop, pop. Now if you watch those, all four cells, they independently will divide. Come on. There he goes. Okay. So they'll continue to divide until the dish is completely confluent and they're bumping into each other. And then that's where we learn that it was really physical contact that's inducing some of the signals that induce the cells to differentiate. But they can differentiate. And those cells that we were just looking at under appropriate conditions can turn into quite mature cells that have electrical properties. They give rise to all the features that we were showing in embryonic cells. So the adult cells in vitro have many of these properties, but they're restricted, very much restricted to giving rise to neurons. So here's an example of even making synaptic contacts. So when we think about repair in the central nervous system, a new paradigm is being considered, and that is taking advantage of the endogenous cells that exist in our cell, in our body, to activate those cells. Not so much transplantation, but activating these small pool of endogenous stem cells and get them to migrate to the appropriate location. A new area of investigation, not completely there yet, but has reached actually threshold at this point so that clinical trials are underway using small molecules that have been discovered using this strategy to enhance neurogenesis in certain disease states. So the other interesting feature about this, and I'll leave you with this thought, is that the neurogenesis that's going on in your brain is not just sort of a linear process that continues throughout life, but rather it declines with age, with stress, with disease, but it can be rescued or enhanced by a variety of things, including enrichment, physical exercise. So here, one of the early experiments, they compared the normal housing conditions of healthy animals raised in this condition compared to animals that had a much more complex environment, so they're matched for their age, matched for their sex, matched for their genetic background, all adults when put into these different environments and then allowed to stay there for a month, and then looked at the number of cells that were born in these areas. And so here's the control, seeing the number of cells that were born over a day period, and these are the ones that survived, fewer number after a month, so a lot are being born, but fewer survive. This is the runners. 
nearly four or five times as many cells are being, are proliferating the brain by virtue of physical exercise and experiment, enrichment or complexity in the environment. And the important thing is that months later, there are many, many more cells that are surviving. Now, the, the actual numbers in, in one representative experiment uh, is based on the idea that in this area of the, of the hippocampus, there are 270,000 of these uh, neurons where the young ones are being born. And uh, you can count the normal controls have a, a tight variance, and there's about around 270 of these cells. With just one month of enrichment, uh, at the end of that time, the total pool of cells was raised by about 15%. And the volume, the area of the, of the area, vo the area, volume of the area increased as well. So <clears throat> one of the most striking uh, results is that there's a linear relationship between distance run, and this isn't really running, it's just moving in a, in a, these are these little treadmills that we make at the Salk. You can buy them on eBay. <laughs> So there's a linear correlation between the uh, cells, uh, the number of cells that are born and the cell and the distance that's, that's run. So does this, uh, and there's a, as I said, there's a dramatic decline that occurs. So a series of, of, of many investigators now have shown this by taking animals that have decreased their neurogenesis dramatically and put, giving them access to a running wheel can dramatically increase neurogenesis, but also changes their cognitive performance. So as previously, they would swim in a maze, unable to find it, with uh, six, six weeks to uh, two months of just physical exercise, voluntary exercise, can do this. So um, we have a treadmill for the mouse, so we have to have a running wheel for the human. So how can we do this? How can we test this out in, uh, in humans to see whether or not this... Well, we can't. It's very hard to measure neurogenesis in living organisms to determine what's happening. But a few investigators are making headway in this, and this is some work that <clears throat> by Scott Small and his colleagues at uh, Columbia University, and we were involved in the early experimentation uh, with this. And he's using functional brain imaging, which measures uh, blood flow and metabolism, and, uh, and glucose uptake within the blood vessels of the brain. And in doing this, um, we took some mice and allowed them to run. And what he was able to show is that in the hippocampal subregions, and in particular, this area where the cells are dividing, showed an increase in glucose after four weeks of running. So not initially, it wasn't just the, extra, the initial burst of movement, but they showed a dramatic increase in blood flow within this, or a significant, let's say, difference in blood flow at four weeks and eight weeks if the animals had this experience. <coughs> and that uh, this correlated with a, an increase in the number of, of brain cells, and so it's literally correlated with brain cells. So Scott, together with colleagues at the University of, or of Columbia University, uh, tethered their imaging experiments onto an aerobic exercise program where they were looking at blood flow, oxygen, and in, in, in kids, I would say, 21 to 45, that were couch potatoes. Well, you know, they didn't have a regular exercise regime. And then he got them into a three-month exercise program where they were uh, four days a week doing 30 minutes to 45 minutes of moving around and was able to see uh, a clear, these are human uh, fMRI signals now, but in this sub-area of the dentate, but not the other areas of the hippocampus, was able to see a signal in a pre-post uh, fMRI examination. And in addition found that when you tested this, the same patients, the same people on these cognitive tasks, before they started three months earlier, and then afterwards on a limited number of these hippocampal dependent tasks, that means a task that is, was built to test the function of the hippocampus, there was a significant effect uh, of an improvement on these uh, subjects. So th for this part of the, of the talk, I, I, the, or my take-home message is that the brain is a plastic 
organ. The brain is an organ that controls our behavior. So we know that, or we should believe that. And that neural stem cells are continually being made uh, throughout life, and they make connections. And the ability of these uh, new neurons to integrate into the circuitry and to be born is dependent upon our behavior. So an individual's behavior can thus uh, affect the structure of your brain. So what you do, coming out here hopefully tonight and listening to this lecture, is stimulating your brain, and that will in fact in turn uh, affect your behavior. So thank you very much for your attention.